welcome everyone to our Wednesday night service. It's Wednesday, February 17th. We have a lovely service planned for you. We have a lot of folks with snow on the call today. So we're going to dedicate tonight's service to our friends that are snowbound and send out a little extra love and heat and warmth and <clears throat> recovery to our friends in Texas. Yeah. Oh, having yes. a really rough time, really right. rough time. So as we start our service, I want to say hello, church family. And so what is our Wednesday night service? It's our midweek pick me up between Sundays. It's a chance for us to get together and review um, the themes uh, that we have established for the month and the Sunday themes. Our annual theme this year is Timeless Wisdom Evolutionary Vision. Timeless Wisdom Evolutionary Wisdom. And our monthly theme in honor of Black History Month is One Journey, Many Paths. One Journey, Many Paths. And it looks like everybody that's on the call has been here before. So if anybody does join us for the first time, we welcome you. Um, we're, but I'm glad everybody's here tonight. We have a wonderful speaker planned for you tonight. Um, <clears throat> it's his first time. So this is um, new territory for him to speak on a Wednesday night. We're glad that he's here. He's one of our practitioners and it's Luis Thompson. I call him Luis. I hope that's the way we say it, Luis. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Luis okay. Lewis, it's okay. Yeah, I, I have that little international flair about me. So <laughs> I recognize that. Um, so you all know you will be muted um, on your microphone and camera um, during the service, and, and that's to improve the quality. Um, Luis, it's our first time. We're a little early, so we're going to start a little early. Again, welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're here. Luis, I'm going to turn it over to you, ask you to open us up in prayer, and then we'll launch into your material. And I understand we'll have a little sharing a little bit later on. Yes, we will event so we look forward to that so Louise, thank you floor is yours sir thank you good evening all so as you relax at this moment taking a deep breath letting go i know that the force that we call god is flowing in through and about every cell of our being. We are filled full with this force, this energy, this one love. And we move and have our being in the harmony, the peace, the upliftment, the strength and the wisdom that is this very force. I know and accept that everyone on this call this evening and beyond this evening is blessed in spirit, mind, and body. And I know that Everything that needs to be shared is shared. Everything that needs to be said is said. Everyone is filled full. The universe blesses this meeting. And in through and about this, I simply let go and let God in each one and the universe I have a little bit of a sniffle, so please ignore that. It's it's not a cold or anything. It's just uh, I have a cough from one of my meds that they are working on, and I have a sniffle from one of my meds they're working on. They're not sure if it's the same one, so they might need to change it. I'm keeping this simple this evening. My talk this evening is called living on the fence.
there has always been a layer of dark and light in my consciousness and my surroundings. Can't say it was my doing or my elders, especially in the beginning. My grandmother, the matriarch of the family, was a medium complexion, short, slightly, not sure where that came from, as vanilla is actually very dark, possibly the flavor that it's found in most of the time. That's what that comes from. My family was a full gamut of the color spectrum. My uncle, being the second from the oldest, a lovely man, very warm, quiet, loving, could play dark face without the makeup. My aunt, the elder of the siblings, passed for white all of her life and was a staunch Christian scientist. The other, se the other seven of my elders fell in between and we could line them up from dark to light and find almost the whole spectrum of color that we call black or African-American colors. I was born in a dimly lit room with lantern light as the means of feeding light into the room. I, growing up, realized that I didn't know what it was at the time. And part of that was the fact that there were now realizing pillows all around me. I lay there looking up, seeing my toes and my fingers, not knowing the question I have was of my grandmother fussing at my mother, usually about water. You see, I, I was premature and My grandmother kept me alive on hot water bottles as there were no incubator for me to use to have. And she spent 31 days sitting in a chair next to the bed for the almost the majority of that time, making sure that I was warm, I was safe, I was protected. And it was my mother's responsibility to boil water all day long, all night long, in order to keep me alive. She would boil the water 
change the fill the hot water bottles that were laying aside, bring them to my grandmother, and my grandmother would change them and give her the coldish ones so that she could take them back to the kitchen and when ready, refill them and bring them back to me so that I could live. Growing up, you know, West Indian Caribbean Island, most of the individuals were black in some shade of some form. Well, I shouldn't say form because that's a physical thing. Or well, shade is too, I can't think of it. The majority of the people on the island were African-American persuasion of some sort. And In my home, between my siblings, my aunt who passed as white, felt, I would presume, I've never had that conversation when I was too scared, I was still a child, felt that she was somewhat better than some of the other aunts that were her sisters. How do I notice, you would ask? I notice because I could sense the shift in energy on both sides when she came to visit. It also had something to do with verbiage. You know how we slightly talk down to folks? Trying not to be rude or obvious. And watching the energy shift after she left. I was raised in a Catholic school in a Catholic church. which it never taught us about our local history beyond the holidays and who was past governors. Stepping back to my grandfather and my grandmother. He was Italian. And when my grandmother and him got together, he owned a third of the island of St. Thomas. I could never get a reasonably answer to the question what happened out of my grandmother. 
My grandfather passed before I was born. But she complained about him so much. He was Danish. He was Caucasian. She spent an awful lot of time complaining about that man. And one thing I found out after, actually after she had passed herself, was the fact that he didn't marry her until his deathbed because he didn't want to go to hell. He was a staunch Catholic. Nine, nine children later, and I don't know how many years. As you've noticed, I've put my talk down because I've, I've, I've decided, uh, I guess spirit decided this was more appropriate. But getting back to myself, this is how I grew up, listening, seeing the little things that light African Americans spewed, for lack of a better word, on dark African Americans. because everybody wanted to be kept in high esteem. Everyone wanted to be kept safe from those, as my grandmother used to say. In high school, I became student council president. And over that year of study, tried numerous times to get ideas and things to improve the school and the student's ability to learn, not only in terms of materials, but to include in the teachings of, especially of history, about the islands and about what really transpired in the past. Every one of my attempts was shot down, being that means that I'm of the yellow, high yellow persuasion, as they call it. But not black and not white, but somewhere in between. It made me look at me a lot more closely than I probably would have if I was darker. Needless to say, I was always jealous of the darkness. I always felt it was more fun. I always felt I was lacking something because I wasn't. I really can't say as that is true now that I'm grown and I know better. I will say that it has done a lot to shape me through my life. It has allowed me to look more at the both sides of the experience of each other. 
and there are times when I can accept and relate more to the Caucasian point of view, and there are times when I can accept and relate to more the black point of view. I've come to the conclusion <clears throat> that the majority of the reason, it might be all, why people are afraid of each other is simply a fear of not being able to survive. Food. If I don't have the means to provide it for myself, for my family, I need to find a way of moving others out of the way so I can safely step up to the plate. The lack can also be equated to healthcare. And I was just thinking of the folks who lovingly supported Trump and decided that he was right and the only way to keep them safe was to invade the White House and stop the shift in power so that they could have their way, their light shine brighter, their day in the sun, so to speak. It's our turn, it's our turn, it's our time. I, I'm not mad at them. I just feel that their consciousness at the time was very skewed, or somewhat skewed. That often happens when we limit ourselves to looking at the smaller perspective and not expanding to a bigger picture. It is my hope that this situation blesses this country in ways that makes it whole and peaceful makes it stronger than it was before. The thought this has done to me, because I had done it to them, or you can't do to me what you've done, I've done to you, uh, comes into play as the Caucasians done to the Indians. At any rate, racism, white, yellow, and dark.
it has been a blessing for me to be yellow. I didn't realize that not till I hit oh this my my seventies. I didn't see the benefit in being lighter back then. I always had this impression that something was wrong. I needed to get melanin from somewhere. I know I couldn't. It's just a sideline. My father and my mother were roughly the same complexion. They were medium, medium, a little lighter than medium on the scale of passing to dark. I'd like to know if anyone has any comments that relate to the shift in power within yourself that has taken place in the last five years or so that brought you to a higher consciousness of yourself in relation to racism. Remember, racism is a man-made situation. And just like it was created, it could be removed. And now open it up to the committee for questions statements of possibility of sharing of concerns of views who'd like to give me their point of view so if everybody would shift into gallery view if you know how to do that with the view at the top and choose gallery view, um, upper right hand corner for most people. And if you'd like to share something or ask a question or make a comment or get some feedback from Luis, um, please turn on your camera and wave and uh, we shall begin. Luis, this is Karen. Hi, Karen. After all those years of being in Monday night circle of prayer, I just have found out so much more about you than I ever knew. And I respect you and love you and just accept the best of you in every endeavor. That's it. <clears throat> Thank you, same here, love you too. I miss, I miss our Monday nights. You're muted, Karen. Sage. I, Sage? I, I, I didn't. Yeah, I, I that I, that was my my comment was brief. Okay. Hi, Sage. Hi. Thank you. Um, so, what you're just thank you, thank you. You did awesome. Um, technical glitches and all. Um, what your discussion kind of made me think of was when I had a, a friend and she kind of personally claimed herself to be white passing. And I had never really heard that term before um, because, you know, when you are born with a certain skin tone, right? Like that's your kind of person. Mm -hmm and you don't necessarily see things from a different perspective 
until somebody points it out. And so I found this to be really fascinating because she was one of my closest girlfriends. And um, I remember it rubbed me the wrong way. And I don't know if it rubbed me the wrong way because she was capable of passing white or more that she identified as white passing or more that I hadn't recognized that there was that phenomenon. I had never, I had never considered it. So it was just really interesting having that level of insight into um, the nature of identification and, and, and projection and um, perception. And I think you kind of touched on that in terms of the different, the spectrum that we are all, yeah, yeah. And, and the beautiful spectrum that we are all, right? And so um, I, I just found it kind of interesting because I didn't necessarily find that place where I could, I, I could relate to her with the, with the um, passing part of it because it was not new to me. And I found myself, um, so I found myself kind of at odds and it was a bit of tug of war. And I think um, that ultimately when we find ourselves at odds and we have this tug of war, that's when we get to do the work. Right. right. So, um, she, she, she was kind of a funny gal. I love her. I bless her. I miss her. But um, she had like, found this guru and she was just like I'm white passing and I have this guru and it was like part of her identity and and I found I found myself judging that um that piece that component and then I was like well, wait a second this is a give and take kind of thing and like who's projecting what right so that moment and that stillness and that awareness and that recognition and, and also that discomfort, that discomfort of, um, of not knowing what it's like to quite pass, not knowing what it's like to identify that way comfortably, not knowing what it's like to call somebody my guru and be so confident in that faith or whatever it is, right? But more importantly, like how how uh, the awareness of that judgmental part of myself reminded me of the work. And um, I don't necessarily think that I went into that conversation of her identifying as a white passing individual as a judge, a, a person passing judgment. Um, but to have that kind of that level of insight and that awareness um, was a very valuable experience for me. So, um, thank you. You're welcome. Turning over the stone. It, a bit, you know? Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Um, as you were talking, Sage, I went back to visiting my aunt at the office one day. And looking at all the African Americans in the room at their own desk. She was a supervisor, by the way. Um, she worked for customs. Uh, and she was over a division of some sort. I don't recall what it was. But I remember going to visit her. and walking to her desk, looking at all the people in that room and wondering, why is she lying to all these folks? That's where my rub began. She not only was lying to herself, but she was lying to all the people she came in contact with. And I found that very, very unsettling. I didn't mention her too, of course, because she was, you know, a lot older than I was, but yeah, it, it really, really, that was, I almost walked out the room and out of the office because of it. <clears throat> I was extremely upset. 
because I felt she was no better than the others, so to speak. She was perpetrating her life for the majority of her life. So I found that really challenging, yeah. I don't know if you relate to the lying aspect of it, but that's what I picked up from my aunt. From her point of view in that direction. Anyone else? Hi, Sabrina. Hello. Hi. Hi, hi. You know, thank you so much for sharing your story because it, it to me, it was very vulnerable and it, it reached me and it touched me um, at a place where I am now and where I've been as well. So thank you so much. And you know, I um, when you were talking, I was thinking, <clears throat> this is um, this is I don't know if you guys could see it, a picture of my mom. Yes. And that that was her when she was young, and um, many of her sisters and brothers look like that, and a couple look like me, and some look like you, and yes, we had all the different shades, and I remember too, especially um, my mother's aunt. Her Aunt Lucille, who would pass, and when she would come and visit, um, she would actually clip her fingernails on our carpet, just sit there and clip her fingernails like she had no regard. Very wow. interesting woman. And, um, and then on the other side, my mother's brother, he passed, but he um, passed for reasons of safety and security and being able to provide for the family. So there was, you know, there were two different yeah, reasons yeah. for the passing, right? And to to the extent where he actually even joined the mafia, and then he could never come home because it wasn't safe for the family. So, you know, I mean, there was really some survival stuff going on. But you asked a question at the end of your just incredibly touching uh, talk, which was, um, how have I shifted in me in power over the past five years. And this has been so re-traumatizing these past five years. And, and, I, and I don't even say that in the worst way because I grew and I became so much more powerful because I understood where it all came from. Yeah. And that gift of understanding allows for the gift that Lucian was talking about last week of forgiveness, it allows for the growth, it allows for, um, someone else said, and still I rise, you know, I mean, it, it tells me that even though I don't, I didn't know what it was, I do come from a history of resiliency and of people who had to do what they had to do in order to survive. And I'm alive today because people did what they had to do to survive. So it's confusing at times, mm -hmm. confusing because, you know, there were people in my own family that would talk about other black people in a very negative way, you know, but that was their hurt and that was their, you know, reaction to being hurt, right? Um, I remember my grandfather, he worked at the United Nations and I remember, and, and I was a, a young black girl growing up, and this is where I'm getting my self-confidence or self-consciousness, you know? And I would hear grandpa saying, oh, whenever a black man is put into my department, I just promote him out because I don't want to be responsible for him. My grandfather was not a bad person, but he understood that he had his job and that's the way he felt he could keep it. And that's wow. kind of that's kind of sad when I think about it. But I had to come to a place of understanding and forgiveness. And that came later in life, but at least it came. Some yes. people don't get that. Yeah. Some people don't get that. So thank yeah. you so much for sharing and being so open and so vulnerable because this is part of this is part of our story. This is part of our history. And I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. And we have to realize too that this country was founded on cotton and the products produced by the South during slavery. The amount of wealth that was created at that time was phenomenal. There is a certain percentage of the individual on the individuals in this country who are still upset about that. The Proclamation, what you call it, proclamation, whatever, the proclamation, something, something, that freed the slaves, shifted all of that. Slaves were leaving the South in droves. Which cut off the wealth of the southern states in and around the entire country. Carmen has your hand up, uh, Louise, when you get a minute. Okay. And the other side to that is that the North, we have to also keep that in mind, the North was getting very jealous. The Northern States was getting very very jealous of the amount of wealth and power that the South was created, the South was creating for for themselves. It wasn't about freedom slaves. It was about wealth and power. And yes, we still have to we still have to survive through a certain amount of deceit, some of us, so that we can do what we need to do to protect our family, to protect our position, to protect our income. That's why we need churches like ours to go out and spread the word. It doesn't have to be that way. Everything can be equal. Once that false beliefs are given up, we can all, we can all live as one because we are one family when you come down to it. Who wanted to speak? Carmen? Carmen? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, thank you, Luis, um, for your um, sermon. I've heard the last of it, and I really, uh, really appreciate it. Um, I want to kind of echo what Sabrina was saying, and also what you were just saying, Luis, about it wasn't about, you know, ending slavery. It was about the jealousy of the North and South, the North being jealous of the South and all the money that they were making. And um, they used slavery as part of the reason for to thwart the South and giving up all that privilege. Um, but uh, just uh, um, echoing on with Sabrina, we, we as Black people, you know, we had to do what we had to do in, in, in getting back to the passing for whites. Um, I remember they're, they're a little known, I don't know if people know, but there were families with, you know, children or relatives who could pass, who were encouraged to pass, to have a better life. Um, being a black person, um, especially through the ages, was no better than being a cockroach. You know, the way that we were treated and uh, the way we were uh, dehumanized to such a point where 
if there was anybody in the family that could have a better life, you know, then they were encouraged to do it. And a lot of times, a lot of whites, a lot of blacks who could pass as whites got the job, passed, got the, the uh, economic security to then support the darker skin um, family members. You know, that's kind of how it was done. Um, we were very uh, innovative as black people. We've had to be, you know, um, lots of um, blacks who could pass for whites were, were used in that sense, you know, not necessarily as spies, but, you know, infiltrators into the white world in order to get ahead, you know. Um, again, Sabrina said it, you have to do what you had to do. So I don't really, you know, blame a lot of, you know, Blacks who did that. Now, there are those who just chose to do it and, you know, forget about their family and things like that. You know, we have that within us, our colorism still today, uh, still used against us, you know, um, and that's still part of our inward, of our inward circle, that stuff that we have to work on. But, you know, I think as a people of, of resiliency, uh, Sabrina puts, you know, I, I am proud. And in the last five years has felt, I tell you in the last four years has felt so, um, um, so empowered to, um, to just speak my truth in a way that I've never spoken before, you know, um, no more allowing the, you know, the racist jokes to get by or they didn't really mean that or, um, you know, that wasn't what their intention was or whatever, you know, and just really speaking up what I feel, you know, uh, as a black person of worth and of, um, a dignity and deserving, you know, of who I am. So it's, it's um, one thing about us, you know, we have learned to live through times and make things better, you know, whatever was going on with us, you know, the, 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 the Jim Crow, the, the Civil War, the, um, the depression, you know, all kinds of economic stripes and different things, you know, we've, we found a way and, um, you know, to move up and to move through. So that's something to really, really be proud of. But, um, you know, I, I, I do, I do appreciate your sharing about the colorism, you know, and that part of our, our history and our legacy, um, you know, being that's, like I said, what, what we do what we had to do. Um, in order to survive and also in knowing that, um, you know, being black, you know, at times had, uh, was just um, a horrible life. It was just a horrible life. You walked around not knowing each day whether you would live or die. Every day was a crapshoot. Every single day of your life was a crapshoot. Will I live today or will I die? Who knows? So thank you for letting me share. Carmen? Yes. Were you finished? Yes, I am. Thank okay, you. I lost you at the end. Yes, we had to do what we had to do. And there are times when we still have to do what we have to do. I am not blaming any sides. I know that everyone is doing what they feel is right. I know that the universe is allowing us to do what we choose as is right, just like it's allowing cats and dogs to choose what is right. Um, yeah, there is no hate involved in this, this for me anyway, it's just a sense of, hmm, 
empathy for in allowing for supporting for uplifting the entire conscious consciousness of this planet so it can shift into a space where everyone is equal everyone has enough housing enough food enough clothing enough ability to be spiritual to be creative to be loving as they choose without anyone else putting any limitations on them outside of harm to others of course hmm. anyone else i just wanted to thank you also louise this is peggy hi peggy <laughs> Good to see you again, as always. <clears throat> thank yes. you for thank you for sharing such a riveting, riveting night tonight. Uh, what a blessing to have you raise this topic in such a wonderful, warm, and vulnerable way. And it has been riveting, and it brings. Of course, we, I can I can relate to so much of what you've said. And one of the things that came to my mind was how. Um, how wonderful it is that we have this teaching and that we are living at this time, at this juncture, right here, right now, that we are watching something that we could not even imagine as children in our lifetime, in my lifetime. I could not have imagined that the world would be experiencing the result of our prayers and our intention and our consciousness that is spreading even in TV commercials and other places you hear the word uh, the words of, of being more conscious you hear the words of being more mindful you hear the you, you know you see people marching from on ev from every country there are bands of like-mindedness spreading throughout this this globe and you know with this consciousness and this practice, I am very, very much um, uh, just so grateful that I'm here now because one of the things I grew up with had to do with um, recognizing how tired I was of teaching. I got, I went through a stage of my life where, where because I was the only black in almost every situation from school through almost every job, and I got tired of teaching and sharing with some of my white family members of what it was to be me and what it was that they didn't understand and how I would struggle and to try to get them to understand that this was something that that they really shared in but they didn't know that they were sharing it and so you raising this this opportunity for us tonight at this time in history at this time in my life is so important uh, to keep my level of consciousness high, to keep my intention and my beliefs higher still. And I just wanted to say thank you for that, for, for being here tonight and saying this for all of us, for me to, to think about and to embody this teaching that says, you are my family. I am one with all of you and that I'm not tired of sharing. I'm not tired of, of telling you my story. I'm not tired of hearing yours either. And that's been important to me. So thank you so much, Luis. Thank you. Miss you being on my tech team. <laughs> <laughs> I miss being there too. Luis, hi, this is Peter. Hi, Peter. I miss seeing you, Luis. <laughs> I miss, I miss you. I miss you too. Yeah. Uh, quickly, I wanted to say that really, it's really in the last two years for me that I've had an opportunity being isolated up here as I am in Portland and being on Zoom and being with, with Peggy and with the team 
and everyone that has been a transformation for me. I am really addressing what, what an opportunity I have had to learn from people of many different walks of life, whether they be different gender choices or different uh, ethnic groups. And it has been a revelation for me and I am grateful and thankful for everyone sharing each Sunday, each Wednesday, I am learning a whole new ways. I, I have been forced to by everything around me. I, I, I left my work, I left everything behind and I was sitting in a kind of a bubble. And this has been spirit's gift to me to learn, to learn because I came from about the whitest background you could imagine. And I had a lot given to me and I am recognizing now that I have a lot a lot to give back and to share and to learn. So thank you. Thank you all. And you, especially Louis for, for doing this. Thank you. You're quite welcome, Peter. Much love. Unless someone has a, a burning share, I would like to move into announcements because our time is rapidly approaching. And Luis, I want to thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you one thing very quickly, Luis. Do you watch PBS at all? Or yes. Have you seen the three-part, th three-episode um, miniseries on um, called "The Long Song"? And if not, I, I would ask you to watch it because it's about um, the Jamaican slavery. Uh, it's a story about a Jamaican slave. And um, her name is Miss July. And she takes us through the slavery period, living on a plantation, and then how England ended um, the slavery issue and how that impacted everybody on the plantation. They raised sugar cane in Jamaica um, in this story. So. It's a great story because she, at the end, survived in a way that you don't expect. So I implore or, or invite everyone to check out the long song, free on pbs.com if you can, or if you catch it on your Masterpiece Theater. Really inspiring. And I thought of you when you mentioned Jamaica tonight that I thought, oh, maybe, maybe Luis would like to check it out. It's a great story. I enjoyed it very much. And it was rewarding and revealing about how Jim, how England treated slavery different than the United States, because they ended, they abolished slavery before we did. Yes, I know that. Right, King George and all of that. So, yeah. so it was a, quite a comparison and how the economics and the sugar cane and everything works. So check it out, the long song. I will. And uh, for a for, uh, slight uh, modification, I was born in St. Thomas, not Jamaica. Oh, I thought you said Jamaica at the beginning. Okay. I apologize. U U U.S. Virgin Islands. No, it's okay. U.S. Virgin Islands. Okay. Very cool. Then we have a, yeah. a, a new frontier to enjoy together. <laughs> okay. I, actually, if I, if, I, if I tell anybody I'm West Indian, you usually go to Jamaica. So, yeah. Okay. It's, it's it's okay. All right, we're all we're all one. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> or we're all wrong. One of the other. <laughs> I I tend to be on the wrong side tonight. So thank you, Luis. You're welcome, Paul. Great. So everybody, yay for Luis. We're running late, so I'm going to run through these announcements. Mr. Peter up in Portland, if you're ready, sir. Um, who's coming on Sunday? Um, we have a special guest speaker, practitioner and ministerial student, uh, Vanessa Kunitz. Vanessa is a passionate teacher, speaker, and writer who uses her voice to serve, inspire, and empower others. She is committed to teaching practical, applied spirituality and believes that by embodying and incorporating spiritual principles and practices, we can all be more empowered to live joyful, joyful 
peaceful and prosperous lives. Meditation is at 10 and the service is at 1030 and that's this Sunday. Also, um, then on our final Wednesday of Black History Month, everybody, is February 24th, next Wednesday. This is super special. If you thought tonight was special, next Wednesday is going to even be a little bit more special because another first timer will be joining us um, delivering a special message for Black History Month. And that's our own Kev Choice. Can you believe it? So if you wanted to, to really see Kev Choice up close and personal, that would be next Wednesday night. He'll be making his debut as a Wednesday night speaker. Come out, support him, and learn from his deep wisdom. And maybe listen to some great music, too. You know that piano goes with him wherever he goes. So I have a feeling it's going to make an appearance. Next Wednesday at 6.30 and service at 7. Black History Month has started off with some great speakers and events will continue throughout the whole month. Um, ongoing Monday through Friday since February 1st to the end of February, uh, Jody Cheney Fernandez, our practitioner emeritus, is doing a devotional with Dr. Dan and she continues the spiritual journey at noon using Dr. Dan Morgan's book, Guidance for a Spiritual Journey, followed by a short discussion and prayer. This book is more than a daily inspirational reading, Jody says. It's a spiritual guide to a spiritual journey. It shifts me and it takes me deeper. So that's at 12 noon um, on the events page. You can see the access information Monday through Friday through the end of the year. Also, there's a grand lineup of Sunday and Wednesday speakers focused on Black History Month. You can see them all up there in the picture up there as well. Um, the village news that Constance sends us is full of interviews with congregants, information about Black History Month, and so much more. Make sure to put info at oaklandcsl.org in your contacts so you won't miss an issue. And Black History Month will end with an afternoon of storytelling with love to Shia Ashanti. Make sure you put Sunday, February 28th after service on your calendar. She's a storyteller and her stories are appropriate for people of all ages. Um, she would like an idea of the number of people who will be attending. So please register to attend on the events page of our website. It's membership time. You've been wondering about what an official voting membership means at Oakland Center. Everyone in the village is a member in our heart, but come to the two hour membership class where you'll learn how to be an official member of the Oakland Center for Spiritual Learning. That's this coming Saturday, February 20th at 1030. You can sign up on the events page of the website for that. That's where you learn what membership entails, it gives you voting rights and um, opportunities to um, help guide the business of the church through different forums um, as a member. Also, My Grandmother's Hands, a book group for white and white identified people with practitioner Chantel Rolfing and Allison McKenzie starts this Monday, February 22nd for six weeks. Um, in this book study, you'll learn about the concepts outlined in the book, as well as reflect on how racism impacts the lived experiences and bodies of people of color. You can register also for that on the web uh, events page of the website, and the love offering is a gift to the center. Remember to like our new Facebook page. Um, visit that at Spiritual living official share it with your friends because it's 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 new also everything is located as you know at our website it is information central um just remember that we have a a, a village facebook group as well as uh the video page with all of the videos um from reverend jeff also the, the recordings of these Wednesday and Sunday night service where you can go, that's on our YouTube channel. And if you wanna receive our weekly newsletter, if you're not already, go to the homepage, lower left-hand corner, 
and submit you the um, email address that you would like to receive the Village News at. I want to thank our Zoom team tonight, Peggy and Peter and Alice Herndon, Sage, um, and Sam, I believe, is all of our folks. So thank you guys for supporting us behind the scenes and making us look good. And you know that for me is not an easy task to make me look good. So God bless them. They're miracle workers. It's a miracle. Um, with that in mind, I'd like just to take a minute and ask you to um, consider um, an offering um, that you can submit to the church in various ways. But whatever that offering is, whether it's time, treasure, or talent, I ask you to hold it in your digital uh, collection bowl and pull that close to your heart and repeat after me as we recite the offering message. This gift I give is God in action. It does good work in the world and blesses creation. And with that, I thank you and I release your offering into the world. There's three ways you can um, submit a financial contribution to the church. Where else? The homepage. There's the donate button if you'd like to use a credit card. Or if you're um, text inclined, there's a way to do it on texting. Um, follow the prompts at 510-327-3431. Or checks can still be mailed to 5000 Clarewood Drive, the address is right there. And we're, we're, we will gratefully and graciously receive your gifts in that manner. So with that in mind, everything is complete and perfect in this service tonight, except for we need a closing prayer. And I'm gonna ask our speaker, Luis, to uh, close out for us tonight with prayer. Luis, if you um, turn on your mic and, and take us home. Hmm. Knowing that this has been a blessed period of time. Knowing that the force that we call God is always, always guiding our steps, keeping us safe, secure, out of harm healthy and well. I give thanks for the sharing this evening. I give thanks for those who have accepted themselves as whole, perfect, and complete right here, right now. <clears throat> I give thanks for everyone on this call knowing it would not be the same without each one of you. I know and I accept each member, each participant of Oakland Center for Spiritual Living. For CSL, for every way in which God is expressed on this planet, for everyone on this planet. I know that love conquers all. It heals all. It releases all pain, all discomfort. So I know love fills this planet, nurturing, supporting, abiding in each and every individual. Knowing that they see the truth of themselves, where God lies, and their oneness with this force. Hmm. Accepting this as truth, I let go. 
I let God. And so it is. Amen. And so it is. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful week. You can turn on your cameras and chat for a minute and say good night. Hey, Lucian, baby. Hey, Lucian, hi. Tanya. Tanya. Thank you. Tanya. Oh. Oh, do you have a meeting moment? So How are you? Doing okay. Hi, Judith.